Hey, physio class, thanks for doing your homework. You guys are so smart. Your learning targets are to know the different components in form blood like plasma and red blood cells and white blood cells. We're going to start talking about some blood disorders, specifically anemia today. And then we're also going to talk about the hormone erythropoietin and erythropoietis, the process of making red blood cells. One of the main functions of blood is as a transport system. You have trillions of cells and all of those cells have needs. They want stuff to stay alive, like oxygen and sugar and salts. And they also, through their own chemistry, create lots of waste, which they want to get rid of, just like we want to get rid of our bodily waste. So they make wastes like urea and ammonia and carbon dioxide, and they want to move those wastes out. Your body also utilizes blood as a transport system for hormones, which are our chemical messengers. So the hormones are made in a gland, but their target organ might not be right nearby. So we're going to utilize the blood to carry that hormone to the target tissue. Other main functions include uh, using the blood as a storage site for some chemicals. For example, the hormone thyroxine is made in the thyroid gland, it helps us regulate our metabolism, but it's just dumped into the blood and there it's carried until it's going to be used. Our liver makes clotting factors, which we need when we tear a blood vessel and we want to clot that blood vessel up. And those clotting factors are made in the liver, but the liver doesn't hang on to them. It just dumps them into the blood and there they circulate until you have an injury in a blood vessel. Heat regulation is also a major function. So when we are hot, we want to lose some of that heat. So we direct blood out to our periphery, to our skin, so that that heat will be carried out into the atmosphere and we can get rid of it. And when we're cold, we constrict blood vessels to the skin. We don't want heat being lost, so we don't send as much blood to the skin. We circulate the blood more in our interior core, and that way we hang on to the heat. So when we're cold, we constrict blood vessels out to the skin, and when we're hot, we dilate blood vessels out to the skin. And of course, our immune system with our white blood cells is another main function. So um, we will talk about the white blood cells and antibodies specifically another day, but they are a main function as well. A 175 pound male will have about five liters of blood. If you're smaller, you'll have less blood. If you're bigger, you're going to have more blood because you have more cells that need to be fed. Um, blood, our blood is always in our arteries, veins, and capillaries unless we have an injury where we've broken a blood vessel. It goes to all tissues according to need. So that means if cells are busy, they're burning up oxygen and sugar and they're creating all kinds of chemicals. So if a cell is busy, it's going to have more needs, and we will redirect blood to those cells. So after you eat a big meal, your um, cells lining your digestive system, your in your small intestine, for example, are busy cranking out all kinds of digestive enzymes. And that chemistry that they're doing uses up energy, and it uses up oxygen. So those cells need new supplies of that energy and oxygen. So we're going to direct blood to those cells. When you're doing your homework at night, the neurons in your brain are very busy. So we're going to send more blood up to the brain. And conversely, if there's um, tissues that are not doing very much, they're not very active, we're not going to send them very much blood. Because blood is transporting a lot of stuff around the body, it holds a lot of information. We can learn a lot about a person's health by checking the blood and seeing what's in it. So at the lab, what they commonly do is spin the blood in a centrifuge and separate the components out by their density. So all the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom and the lighter stuff rises to the top. And that gives us three layers in the blood, the plasma layer, the buffy coat, and then the red blood cells at the bottom. So in the plasma, we find a lot of the hormones or proteins that are floating around in the blood. Some of those proteins are albumin, globulin, which are our antibodies for our immune function, fibrinogen, which is a clotting factor, helps our blood clot, 
The albumin helps us control um, and regulate water movement from cells to the blood. There's lots of minerals or ions floating around in our blood like sodium and potassium and calcium. Nutrients from um, digestion, so amino acids, fatty acids, glucose, waste. So cells, again, are creating waste all the time. They dump that into the bloodstream, like carbon dioxide. And hormones, those chemical messengers we were talking about that are made in an endocrine gland and then sent to a target organ. This is a chart from your book just summarizing some of the plasma proteins that are floating around in your blood, and I just wanted you to look at um, where a lot of these are being made. So you can see from the chart, many of them are made in the liver, but then they're just dumped into the bloodstream, and that's where they circulate until they're being utilized. So the plasma was the lighter top part of that centrifuged blood. It was the liquid part of the blood. The heaviest part of the blood is the red blood cells. So the bottom of the center view sample is the red blood cells because there's so many red blood cells. There are about um, 25 trillion red blood cells in the body. And in just one milliliter of blood, we would find 5 billion red blood cells. Red blood cells have a special shape. They call it a biconcave disc. So it's kind of like you took a donut and you pinched in the middle part, so it was depressed on both sides. That gives red blood cells flexibility. So they have to squeeze through very tight spaces when they get down to the capillary blood vessels, which are microscopic blood vessels, and they're moving through there in single file, and it's a tight fit. So their shape um, helps them to squeeze through. They are 30% hemoglobin, which is the special pigment that carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, they don't have a nucleus. Part of the reason they don't have a nucleus is nuclei are big. And again, they have to squeeze through very tiny blood vessels, those capillaries. So we want them to be small cells. So no nucleus means they get to be smaller. But unfortunately, without a nucleus, they can't divide and reproduce. So they don't have a very long life. They only live about 120 days. And um, they accumulate damage as they're traveling around through the body and getting bing, bang, bing, banged against the walls of blood vessels. So about 120 days, they're um, worn out, tattered, torn, linking their contents, and they need to be replaced. So most of you know red blood cells carry oxygen, but they also carry waste products. They carry carbon dioxide, and they carry that carbon dioxide in another form called HCO3, or bicarbonate, which we will talk about later. So here's what those red blood cells or erythrocytes look like. So you can see how they're dimpled or pinched in in the middle. <clears throat> I told you that that helps give them flexibility. That's true, but it also helps um, create a larger surface area. So we want these red blood cells to carry as much oxygen as they can. So if we give them a larger surface area, they can have more hemoglobin pigment and they can carry more oxygen. Suppose, Suppose there, were there were only one, one red, red cell, cell in the entire, entire system. system. Suppose, Suppose you could travel, travel with that cell, cell as it makes just, just one of its circuits. circuits. You, are you are here, here in the right, the right side, side of the heart. heart. Your, journey Your journey begins with a heartbeat. Your first destination is a lung. Capillaries in the lungs lie right next to extremely thin membranes. Through these membranes pass oxygen and other gases. The membranes make up millions of air sacs. When we inhale, the air sacs fill with fresh air. As the red cell sweeps past an air sac, it latches onto oxygen that has dissolved in the plasma. The cell turns a brighter red. The oxygen-rich cell then flows back to the left side of the heart, completing the first loop of its circuit. The heart drives the blood out again, this time into the body. The course it takes is determined almost completely by chance. The 
dead cell will release its cargo of oxygen only in a capillary and only when the cells surrounding the capillary have less oxygen than the blood has. At the same time, it will pick up some of the waste carbon dioxide that has become part of the bloodstream. When the red cell has less oxygen, it turns a dull red. The capillaries are so narrow that red cells must squeeze through in single file, showing the importance of their elasticity. Our typical red cell passes from the capillary into the venules, and then into veins. It flows back to the right side of the heart, completing the second loop of its circuit. As we saw, it then travels back to the lungs. There it releases its load of carbon dioxide and picks up a new load of oxygen. The cycle begins again to continue for the life of the cell. The kidneys and liver contain chemoreceptors that are monitoring oxygen levels. So if oxygen levels go down, both the kidney and the liver can release a hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin travels through the blood to its target organ, which is red bone marrow, and it will stimulate the production of new red blood cells. And as we make more and more red blood cells, the numbers of red blood cells will go up. They'll be able to carry more oxygen, and so the kidney and the liver won't see low oxygen levels anymore, and they'll stop making erythropoietin. And that's a classic example of a negative feedback loop. This is a nice chart in your book you can reference to go back through the steps in red blood cell production. People that have a deficiency in mature functioning red blood cells are considered anemic. And there are several different causes for these anemias. Some are from toxic chemicals or radiation that damage the bone marrow. And then that bone marrow cannot make red blood cells. Some are diet related. Very common one is iron deficiency anemia. And that affects teenage girls particularly because uh, when the teenage girl is first starting her menstrual cycles, they tend to lose a lot of blood. And they have to replace a lot of blood because of that. And they might not have enough iron in their diet to build all of that hemoglobin back. So teenage girls can oftentimes be anemic and they're given iron supplements to counteract that. Um, there can be anemias because of mutations, gene mutations. Sickle cell anemia is a very um, common uh, blood disorder and it's because the protein necessary to form the correct shape of a red blood cell is missing. And so what we have are these sickle shaped or quarter moon shaped cells and they don't carry enough oxygen. And those cells also kind of get stuck inside of joints and clog up joints and it can be very painful when that happens. As I mentioned before, red blood cells, erythrocytes, only live about 120 days. They don't have a nucleus and they can't reproduce. So as they are traveling through the vessels, they become damaged, they get torn, they start to leak their contents, and we have macrophages located inside the spleen and the liver that are looking for these damaged red blood cells. And when those macrophages find them, they phagocytize them or eat them. So they're eating those damaged red blood cells and then they recycle the parts that can be recycled like heme and iron. So with heme and iron, we can rebuild hemoglobin again. Transporting various substances that must be carried to one part of the body or another. Red blood cells are an important element of blood. Their job is to transport oxygen to the body's tissues in exchange for carbon dioxide, which is carried to and eliminated by the lungs. Red blood cells are formed in the red bone marrow of bones. Stem cells in the red bone marrow, called hemocytoblasts, give rise to all of the formed elements in blood. If a hemocytoblast commits to becoming a cell called a proeryproblast, it will develop into a new red blood cell. The formation of a red blood cell from hemocytoblast takes about two days. The 
The body makes about 2 million red blood cells every second. Blood is made up of both cellular and liquid components. If a sample of blood is spun in a centrifuge, the formed elements and fluid matrix of blood can be separated from each other. Blood consists of 45% red blood cells, less than 1% white blood cells and platelets, and 55% plasma.